Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening. Today, we are getting into some shenanigans back in the Dear Media studios with a fellow podcaster from hashtag No Filter Podcast with Zach Peter. How are you? Hi, Sheena. I'm great. I like this um, switching now. Now I'm not on your show. You're on mine. It's about time. I'm not used to being on the other side of the mic. I'm used to like grilling people in the hot seat. On yeah. Their well, I mean, we can go back and forth. If there's anything that, you know, you want to ask, go ahead. But um, right now we're doing, I guess technically we're doing a little drinking and podcasting. Yes. So I want you to tell me about these adorable little cans we're drinking. Mine says, cut down my drinking or what? And there's a diamond going into a puddle with a crown on top of it yes it's a melting ice queen and so that one's inspired by real housewives of beverly hills that's erica jane's iconic or what or what or what yeah yes and then i have my i'm not going out tonight i'm disengaging which is perfect because uh, Salt Lake City just came back and Beverly Hills is is just wrapping. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's a, it's my housewives inspired wine line. I have a fizzy white wine and a fizzy rosé, all inspired by different like iconic housewives moments yeah. that we. I mean, I just figured we're all watching housewives and like yelling at the TV and drinking anyway. So why not have totally. a fun wine that's strong so it gets you Liddy City because it's thirteen percent alcohol by volume. No, these but there's things- no sugar in it. I learned at your show. Yes. I was a part of Zach's live show with our friend Adam. And I was one of the guests. And they had all of these cute little drinks there. Yes. And one woman came up to me and she goes, hey, I just want you to know those are really strong. They get you fucked up. And I was like, good to know because I probably would have had like two or three because they're so small. <laughs> yeah. Well, one can is like a quarter bottle of wine. So four cans is like a whole bottle. And people just yeah, like I guess that makes sense. because they're tiny and they're compact. Because I like to like right. sneak it into my Uber. No, or, I love you it. You know, you can throw it in your purse or it's a nice little pregame. Um, but I'm like, but I don't want, you know, like, listen, I it's not bad. I, I, I like having a good seltzer. Yeah. But like, they're always like 4% alcohol. So Nothing. I'm like, no, I'm like, let's cram as much as we can. Yeah. Make it efficient and let's get lit. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like it's pointless to drink the seltzers. I'm like, I may as well just have a LaCroix. Now yeah. I'm drinking calories and I'm not yeah. getting drunk. No. Because you just, need at least four of them to get a little less. And even I had four recently at a birthday and I was like, I'm done drinking. I'm just going <laughs> to switch to water because I'm yeah. still sober. Yeah. I have a really high tolerance. Yeah. Well, <laughs> All right. Well, cheers. as the can says, cheers, sip some wine and let's spill some tea. Mm. Well, I promise not to disengage. So I will fully engage with you today. Okay. Awesome. So we, how did we me was it just doing your show is that the first time we met i think so i think you yeah you came on my podcast yeah because you've been on a couple times you did it yourself and then with brock yeah and i feel like we always make headlines every time well we do, we do because there's always some drama <laughs> going on in our group so i know last season on vanderpump rules if you guys remember, there was a podcast that I called Ariana about that Lala did when she said, like, I don't give a fuck about you or whatever. Yeah. That was your podcast. Yes. There was also something I think I said on your podcast about Lala or maybe Stassi or someone that got back to them and drama. Yes. But you always get the tea. It's listen, it's my job. I've been doing it for a minute. I know how to like get people to like kind of feel well, first of all, I like to get them lit. Yeah. Um, you didn't have the luxury of doing that because we uh, we taped like via Zoom because I think it, it was, was like also 2020. Pregnant, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, no, I just I like to get people feeling comfortable, get them a little lit, and then yeah. get them to spill some tea. No, you're so easy to talk to. So it's like I feel like I'm like, oh, I'm just talking to like one of my best friends. And yeah, you get the tea for sure. You're very good at your job. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I feel like at this point, now I get like worried when I get like Google alerts about like when the show is getting picked on. I'm like, oh no, what, like what happened? What was Wait, it said? Yeah. Did I get my guests in trouble? <laughs> Did I get in trouble? Um, yeah, it's it's always a fun time in the Google alerts. Totally. I decided to not do the Google alerts on it's myself smart. because I can only imagine. I mean, I very rarely Google myself as yeah. is, but if my phone was going off daily and I saw all of that, like... I try to not read the comments. I try to just 
stay out of that. It's so hard because like once you go down the spiral, and you used to be good at like clapping back in the comments. I remember. Yeah, I mean, I still will occasionally. <laughs> I read the first, the first 20 are usually people I also follow. Yeah. And then I'll maybe read the next 20. Yeah. But I don't usually go past that. So if I see ones in those like top 20 to 40 comments that need to be clapped back at, yeah. I will. But I've also blocked a lot of words on Instagram. Smart. So I don't see as much as I used to see as well. Smart. Yeah. What words do you have blocked? Oh my God. That <laughs> that would be fun to read. Shall we? Yes. Okay, wait. I don't even remember where to find that part. Do you know? No, I've never blocked any words. Let's I probably see. need to block words. I just learned how to like block certain <laughs> things on like Twitter, um, which I indulge in Twitter way more than I probably should because like if you think Instagram comments are bad, I feel like Twitter is like the worst oh, of social media. Way worse. Okay, I'm in settings. Is it maybe under privacy, I think? I actually hidden need to words. learn how to do this. Hidden words, yes. Okay, where are my hidden words? Wait a second. Okay, they're not there. Wait, that's so weird. Now they're not here. I wonder... I don't know. Do you know, like, what words normally trigger you, though? Well, like, I had, a, like, homewrecker blocked oh, a yeah. lot. It was just, like, annoying. So you, and didn't, you don't it, see Brandy Glanville's tweets anymore? No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, whenever I hear from her, it's always positive. I feel like she's always very positive unless she's, like, on Watch What Happens Live or yeah. unless she's, like, in an interview. I and know. then it's, like, a turn. Yeah, like, recently she was on Watch What Happens Live and she was like, like, Sheena, the, what's her name? Yeah. And I'm like, you texted me last week. Don't act like you don't know my name. Yeah. But she just, you know, that's that's her shtick, I guess. So, yeah, yeah I don't know where to find those. Um, maybe that's why I've been getting more comments lately. Maybe the hidden words when I did, like, an Instagram update. Reset? See, I don't like turning Ooh. them off because I like the engagement. I'm like, just keep the engagement coming and then my content filters at the top and yeah, I st I'll still win. No, I do. Like, I don't block people yeah. nearly as much as I used to. Back in the day, I would block like all the time. Yeah. But I tend to, uh, what is it, restrict? Yeah. I'll do that sometimes because the people who say really hateful things, I don't even want that engagement. I don't need that to filter yeah. into any algorithm. I'm just like... You can fuck off. No, I so. agree. I, I fall down the rabbit hole sometimes. Yeah. I like love to read it and then it like makes me mad and then I'm like, what am I doing to myself? I need to like go meditate and get laid. Yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your podcast, hashtag no filter with Zach Peter, you do that three days a week. Three days a week. So How we do, do you do that? <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, and Friday we release new episodes and then we do live streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh my God. So this yeah. is like a full time Oh yeah. All, every day. Content twenty four seven. And wow. then we have Instagram reels, so those are like quicker, like bite sized tea yeah. that I do. Um and then um, I just and I just signed on to do a new podcast with Spotify and The Ringer. And so I'm just like content, content, content 24-7 at this point. Wow, you are so busy. Well, thanks for having the time to be here. Thank you. I, it's kind <laughs> of annoying, though, because usually usually I would, I would have like a day or two, like a week where I would just kind of like veg out and right. just be in like sweats and I would catch up on like housewives or whatever shows I needed to watch for the week or sometimes just like guilty pleasure shows. And now it's like, no, I have to get ready every day because I have yeah. to tape something every day. Uh, How long have you been doing it, your show? Yeah. Uh, no filter I've been doing for seven years, but it's like evolved over those seven yeah. years. I've been doing it for a while, but it, it, the show that it started as and the show that it is now are not the same show, even though it's technically been the same name and it's kind of always been in like the pop culture world. But right. I feel like now it's kind of known as like the reality TV podcast yeah. where there's always like tea oh, and definitely. reality stars and stuff like that. I know just the other day I like matched with somebody on Bumble and then I was like excited because I was like, oh, he's kind of hot. And then he's like, oh my God, you're the housewives guy. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't want to be known as the housewives guy. I want to get fucking laid. Oh my God, that's funny. So you just said you have a new deal with Spotify. Yes. So you're doing the in the ringer to yes. co-host. 
Yes. So there's two new shows. Yes. Well, so I'm just joined as a co-host for The Ringer Dish. Okay. And then we also are doing a new show called You're Doing Amazing, Sweetie, which yeah. is all focused on the Kardashians. So we cover the Kardashians on Hulu, Kardashians News, and then like review products. So like we just reviewed like Kendall Jenner's 818 Tequila and Skims because I wear Skims. Um, oh, and I wear so Skims too. I they're love the them. best. Yeah. I need a Skims bra. Um, JK. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we cover Kardashian stuff every Friday. Friday on You're Doing Amazing, Sweetie. And then I do pop culture deep dives. They're called history lessons. Yeah. But I'll go, I'll deep dive into popular like pop culture moments for the Ringer Dish. So okay. I got both of those in addition to all my no filter stuff. Wow. Love that. Well, let's get into a little Kardashians. I was looking at your page last night and I saw something about Chloe maybe having a new boyfriend. Yes, I want her to have this boyfriend. His rep has come out. His name is Michaela Maroney, and uh-huh. he's an Italian actor. He's on. That sounds like the Olympian gymnast yes. from the USA team. <laughs> yes. And so he does like these really like hot scenes for, I guess there's like a 365 days film series on Netflix. Okay. And so he stars in those. And if you like actually Google that and look at his gifts, they're like so hot. But he was spotted with her at Kim's recent fashion show that she did with Dolce & Gabbana. Uh-huh. Oh. And so they like did they snapped a photo together and they were sitting together. And so his rap has come out and they're like, they're not dating. They were just taking photos together. But I'm like, Chloe, after everything she's been through, like, let him break your back for a night. Yeah. Like she deserves she it. She deserves that. She's earned it. I know. Totally. I am loving the new seasons on Hulu. I love the way it's shot. I love everything about it see we need to pick up the the uh production value on vanderpump we need to shoot it like how hulu and peacock are shooting all of their shows because it's just like so like well, stay tuned top. season oh. 10 is yet to come season 10 is yet to come <laughs> well, i look forward to it yeah no there were definitely drones flying at the wedding ah okay yeah. see that's what we need a drone yeah. it's like with the wedding the venue in mexico was so pretty i was like living vicariously on instagram and just like it was every so fun. And then we realized there was an extra drone that wasn't my wedding videographers, wasn't productions. And there was this random ass little boat out in the ocean. There's there's no boats anywhere to be seen, but there's just this one. And right as I walked down the aisle, I noticed the boat because in my head I was like, oh shit, this is going to be in the background of all my photos. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, whatever, ignore. And I had a few, I was like, I wonder if that's paparazzi. Like, it was just so obvious. Yeah, it was yeah. right there. And I see, like, the workers, like, it was kind of distracting right at the beginning of the ceremony. Because then the workers from the hotel are, like, on their walkie-talkies. And I'm just, like, trying to ignore that happening. Like, yeah. there's enough already going on. But it turned out that, I guess, yeah, it was, like, it paparazzi, was paparazzi in a boat. And they also had a drone. But then I've only seen a little bit of content from that angle so interesting i don't know it was weird but i did have a moment where i was like i feel like a kardashian like when they're on vacation and there's someone like trying to get their photo i'm like i mean it was kind of cool well i mean and when they're investing in like the drones right like, paparazzi like i feel like now paparazzi is just like an iphone in a restaurant but like if they're getting the drones that's like yeah, a budget i know so kardashians yes i want to get into it so tell me what are your favorite products do you have a favorite kardashian who if you could like if you could be friends with any of them who would you want to go out with okay i think i feel like everybody says chloe and and i feel like she's gotten like a lot of heat recently but i feel like my favorite used to be courtney and i still kind of love courtney but she's like so in love with travis and it's just like too much pda for me even though i'm trying so hard to get on the lemmy her new vitamins the lemmy um uh, PR list because she like sent out like these giant gumball machines that were like so fun. I was like, I need some better PR list to get put onto. Um, I was like, Courtney, send me some some Lemmy gummies. I'll Lemmy matcha and talk about it on Spotify. Yeah. Uh, but I love Courtney, but I think my favorite right now is definitely Kim. Uh-huh. I'm not, I don't fuck with the Jenners. Like Kendall is to me, like I'll drink some 818 tequila and it's not bad, but like I think she's boring. And I don't know how people are like, oh, I love Kendall. She's like the most natural. I mean, sure. But I think my favorite is definitely Kim and sometimes Courtney. Yeah. Why Kim? I just feel like she's such 
a boss bitch. Yeah. I love that she has kind of just come into her own. She's very unapologetically herself. Like in season one of the Kardashians, we see her going through her breakup with Kanye and kind of second guessing her fashion choices. And I feel like the Kim that we're getting this season is just so much more confident. She, you know, owns it a lot more. She's unapologetic. You know, I know she gets in trouble and she has like, you know, her heat for like her get your fucking ass up and work comments. But I just feel like, listen, she works her ass off. Yeah. She is a bad bitch. I feel like I, I would love if they were a little more honest, like about some of their cosmetic procedures. Me too. Because like, just share the wealth. Tell us what you yes, did. Yes, it's not. I don't believe because she's not I, that big of a deal. What was it? I, I, was it Vanity Fair? She did an interview recently, which is like the most I've ever done. Is like a little bit of Botox. And I'm like. No. Come on. I was like, I know. No, you have definitely gotten, you definitely do lasers. You've definitely gotten a little under eye filler. Like, you know, you can spot it. It's, and it's good work, but I'm just like, just oh, it's like, amazing. be She's honest perfect. about it. Exactly. Yeah, I do wish that too, because I always, I'll look at celebrities or reality stars or whoever people on TV and I'm like, I wonder what they did Yeah. because it looks so good and so natural. You know, other people want to do that, not necessarily to look like them. Yeah. You know, you're not going to go and get plastic surgery. I mean, there are people who well, do that. And, but. but and as you know, plastic surgeons don't just do a good plastic surgeon doesn't yeah. just do what you tell them no. to do. They do what works for your face. Exactly. Yeah. But I do wish they would all. I'll be a, a little more honest about what they do because I'm so curious because they look so good. Yeah. And I mean, I think they all look pretty natural still. I feel like also you get better with makeup and yeah. angles and lighting and yeah. all of that. So I can see why people think they've had probably more work done than they actually have. But I yeah. just wish they would be like, yeah, I did a little filler here, did this. Like, I'm yeah. so open. I'll post yeah. from the doctor's office, sitting in the chair, getting my face injected. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. So if yeah. you don't like it, here's what it is. If you do like it, <laughs> here's his number. <laughs> right? It's so funny because then there are people online that are just like, just be natural. Like, why do you have to be so fake? And I'm like, bitch, if you had the opportunity yeah. to be here, you'd be in this seat too. Yeah. I like my face frozen. Yeah. I like to not have so much experience. Expression. I for two years I couldn't exactly. get Botox. I oh, was pregnant the baby. Yeah. and then I was breastfeeding. No. So I barely got Botox for the first time just a few months ago. Yeah. And I love it. I'm like, no, I don't want my forehead to move. Yeah, there's lip flips. Yep. There's so much you can do that's like non invasive. It's like not necessarily reversible, but it'll wear off. Or yeah. if you do get filler, you can reverse yeah, you can it because it. there's an um a solution you can yeah. put in to dissolve. Yeah. But um and it's like, it's it's enhancements. It's my face. It's totally. my body. It's like, if it makes you feel good and it makes you feel confident, then like, why does anybody else care? Yeah, exactly. So other than the Kardashians, what are you watching right now? Obviously, Housewives. Yes. Um, yes, Housewives, obviously. I just finished the Marilyn movie on Netflix, Blonde. Wait, what? I don't know if I've seen that. It just came out, I think, over the weekend. Oh, then no, I definitely haven't seen it yeah. yet. I love Marilyn movies. I watched Blonde and I watched Hocus Pocus 2. I and need to watch that too. Is you it so good? It? No, I, I haven't love a time Hocus yet. Pocus 2. It's so different from the original. Okay. Um, it's more Disney and it's more like family friendly, but like it's still so good. And yeah. it, you know, it was nostalgic and it was, it was just, it, I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I and I was worried because I was like, anytime a sequel comes out, it's it's a little worrisome. Um, but and then Blonde, I really enjoyed too. I know it's gotten a lot of heat, and people are like, the critics are coming for it, and people are coming for it, and they're like, don't exploit Marilyn. But I'm like, if anything, I came out of the film having so much more compassion compassion yeah. for Marilyn because there were so many things about like her trauma and things that she experienced that I had no idea about. All we see is this glamorous woman, and this kind of peels back the curtain, and you know, it is a lot more. I don't know if vulgar is the right word, but it's a lot more, um, it's dark and there's, you know, it's a lot more adult than I think people would expect, but it, I thought it was really, I thought it was really good and paid Ooh. tribute to the trauma that she's faced that we yeah. haven't really heard about. And I think if anything, it made me have a lot more empathy for her. Yeah. What did you think about Kim Kardashian wearing her dress? I thought it was iconic. Yeah. Listen, Kim Kardashian always, I've always said, and I know I get shit for saying this, I think Kim Kardashian is a modern day Marilyn. And yeah. I know people disagree with that all the time. That's totally fine. It's just my opinion, so fuck off. Oh, no. I'm and so, but I think 
she has, you know, I think the Kardashians overall kind of just revolution. Uh, they've changed like what we see as beauty. Like before it was only like blonde, really skinny girls. Right. And totally. then they came and they are Armenian and they have dark hair and they had hips and they had curves. And so that kind of changed. And I feel like she's always kind of on the cutting edge of what's next when it comes to like beauty. Yeah. And yes, there have been cosmetic procedures, but it's like Marilyn's hair wasn't naturally bleached blonde. Right. You know, so I feel like Kim is just a modern day, you know, archetype for what it means to be a woman and I think she's continuing to kind of push that boundary yeah and so when I saw her wear the Met Gala dress I thought it looked phenomenal yeah um the lengths that she went through show her determination right to fit into the dress and to have that moment yeah but see that's where I was confused about the dress is because Kim is so tiny and I thought Marilyn Monroe was always more voluptuous I know back in the day people thought Kim was like huge and had this big butt and it was like no like she has such a killer body but she's itty bitty yes and she's really short I don't think Marilyn was as short as she was yeah or she is so I mean I was surprised to see that she needed but I also get it like she has like the big hips that I just I I think they're probably maybe a little cosmetically enhanced as well (laughs) I think they're natural but also slightly enhanced so I think we had to and see that's what I want to know because I want to do that to my hips (laughs) right but I'm like is it filler they do a lot of I know they do a lot of like body sculpting yeah and so it's like reshifting of the fat yeah so so you can, you know, and get that the stuff booty. scares me though. Yeah, I'm like, I'm already thin. I'm not gonna do a lipo fat transfer sort of thing, but I do wish my hips were rounded out more. So I'm like, how'd you get that? See, the world wants to know. Anytime I gain weight, I gain it in my hips. I get it from my mama, and I don't let I gain all my weight in my lower body. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, oh. every time my, my jeans fit a little tight in, in the thighs, I'm like, okay, I've been eating a little extra carbs lately. I've had one too many no filter wines. Yeah. <laughs> I do actually want to get into that as well. Talk about how you've been so open about your eating disorder. But before we get to that, let's take a little break. I actually wanted to get into some of that because you've been so open about your eating disorder. I read your Pop Sugar and Men's Health articles that you wrote last night. And I, as someone who struggled with anorexia in college because of the Paris Hilton types, pre-Kim Kardashian, you needed to be skinny. I wanted to be an actress. I had that relationship with the scale where I would step on it seven, ten times a day if I gained 0.2 pounds. I wouldn't eat anything else. I had goldfish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I would portion out every single thing. And when I was reading your articles, I was like, oh my God, I completely can relate to this. So I love that you are so open about it. And um, yeah, I just kind of want to ask a little more about that. What made you want to, you know, write those articles and go public and talk about all of that? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's hard to host a podcast called Hashtag No Filter and then to filter parts of my life, right? You know, so I'm very open and honest with people. And listen, I put all of my messy out there and I open myself up to criticism and I welcome a lot of criticism. But I just, I feel like I have to be open uh, open and honest with my audience because I feel like they are going through I always say we're going through life together Mm -hmm. so they struggle with things as well and I love that at least like on Housewives and reality TV we're starting to see these things become more part of the forefront you know in Beverly Hills this season we saw Crystal open up about her eating disorder last season on Jersey we saw Jackie open up about her eating disorder and for me I just felt like it was really important because I feel like people would look to me and they're like oh you eat so healthy you're slim you're this you're that and I'm just like but that wasn't the place that I started at You know, I grew up very overweight. Food was a coping mechanism for me. So I would just kind of eat my feelings. I would eat like four Hot Pockets and a bowl of cereal and like dig through the cabinets and find whatever I wanted next. And I gained a lot of weight. So by the time I went into high school, I was not confident in my body and I just wasn't confident in who I was. And so to kind of reclaim control over my life, I started engaging in bulimia and I would have the binge and purge cycle Mm -hmm. that also wasn't healthy either. But to me, it helped me lose weight. And then people start giving you compliments when you lose weight, right? right? So then my idea identity was really based off of being overweight or being underweight and so I would use my body as a way to either get attention or to get people to focus on me and that 
kind of took a deep end turn when I went into college and I ended up losing a lot of weight and I was abusing diet pills and I was, uh, my diet was like really, really strict. And then I stopped eating, you know, I fell in love with a guy and he broke my heart and like I needed somebody to pay attention to me. So I ended up losing a lot of weight and just became so fixated because I was like, I had control over this when I originally lost weight in high school, when I went from really big to really slim. And now I was going down this dark path to the point where I had lost so much weight that I remember there was a moment where I was sitting at the dinner table with my family and I looked up and I saw my reflection and I just saw how sunken in my face had become and how I just no longer recognized who I was and nobody in my family if they did they never said anything but nobody really understood what was going on nobody knew that I was purging five times a day or that I was just so unhealthy with my habits I think there was a little bit of concern about like how fast or how much weight I was losing but like I was always like I'm fine I'm busy I'm in school and I'm working and I just you know I'm on the go all the time and so I kind of just reached that point where I was like I I'm killing myself. And if I continue to go down this path, it's not going to end well. And so I remember I secretly checked myself into a treatment center, didn't even tell my family, told them like I was off at work. And so I remember going into the center for, it was bulimia at the time, because I'd went in for two consultations and was clinically diagnosed with bulimia. And they were like, you you know, this is probably the best step. And luckily I had a job at the time who, you know, I had a boss that was very supportive of me going off and she just kind of encouraged me to do what I needed to do to take care of myself and to take off the weeks that I needed to focus on them. And so I went into treatment. I did it for only four weeks. I ended up checking myself out early and kind of uh, keeping up with therapy. But I just wanted to make sure that I was also not just, you know, I struggled in the traditional therapy treatment center because for them it was more of just like learn how to just make peace with eating cookies and learn how to just make peace with being okay with donuts. But in my head, I was just like, but I at the time was doing so much research on nutrition because my brother was diagnosed with autism and I was learning about how nutrition impacts the body and impacts Mm -hmm. the brain and so I was like but I'm learning about these things and I'm learning about how certain proteins and how sugar can actually be addictive in your body and I feel like you know I just I want to try a different method and so I ended up checking myself out of that treatment center and going on my own journey and talking to doctors and reading books and kind of educating myself on nutrition and educating myself on the psychology of eating disorders and keeping up with therapy and so I think I went with a more unorthodox approach Um, and I had to be very careful because I know orthorexia is kind of an issue too and that's where people have an obsession with only eating healthy. I've gotten to a strong oh. place now where I don't consider myself bulimic, anorexic, orthorexic, or any of those things. It was obviously a very long journey. And, you know, there was a lot of therapy. There was a lot of education. There was a lot of, you know, making sure I consulted with multiple doctors to really educate myself to make sure I felt empowered in the decisions that I was making. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just making sure that when I was eating, it was about fueling my body, but also making sure that I'm able to enjoy myself and have, you know, fun in life and not feel restricted either yeah. you know where now I can get it to a place where I can drink wine and I can you know have some some cookies or you know enjoy myself at a birthday party or whatever the case may be and kind of find that fine balance in life mm-hmm. but also know that I need to take care of myself and nur- nourish my body and make sure that my mental emotional and physical health are a priority because I think too many people focus on one of the three yeah you know I know mental health is a really big thing that people want to talk about right now but we also forget like the physical health or the underappreciated emotional health. I think being in tune with how we feel and being in tune with how we process emotions or how we store emotions in our body and how that's unhealthy as well. I think all of those things are parts of the conversation that we don't realize like it's a full trifecta, mental, emotional, physical, Mm -hmm. and you know, in some cases for some people spiritual as well. And so I, you know, just kind of had to go on my journey to, to find that peace. So when people look to me and they're like, oh, you seem to be in a really good place. I'm like, but it didn't it didn't start that way. And this yeah. is the journey that I went on. So I was really grateful to Pop Sugar and to Men's Health for giving me an opportunity to share what I had learned and share my journey with my body, you know, and and show people that like, listen, it's not an easy journey, but it is possible. You're not going to find a solution being, you know, overweight and unhealthy or underweight and unhealthy. It's Mm -hmm. more about doing the inner work to make sure how you feel about yourself is strong and empowered. Yeah. 
Wow, good for you. That's very inspirational. And just reading both articles last night, they were both different. And I learned something from men's health that I didn't learn in the Pop Sugar one. And that's when I was just like, wow, I can completely relate. And I'm sure there are so many people out there as well who can. And that's what I found is so many people were able to relate, maybe not at the scale or maybe worse or maybe less, but they were able to relate on some level. And I guess just to see that like it's possible to find your own journey and to find your own footing and to learn how to trust yourself and to trust your body and to be able to you know just know that there is another side yeah that was one of the scariest things about pregnancy for me was having to slightly monitor my weight to make sure I wasn't gaining too much too quickly yeah but then every week or every few days or whenever it was that I was like weighing in when I just kept seeing that number go up and up and up to the highest number I've ever weighed in my life. Yeah. It was scary. My doctor originally told me, he goes, you know, about 25 to 30, 35 pounds is like what you should gain. I hit 35 pounds when I still had a full trimester to go. So then I was like, but how much more am I going to gain? And it was just like, I was getting scared. And then I'm asking my friends, I'm like, are you gaining this much? Like, am I gaining too much? Then I was like borderline gestational diabetic, but I ended up passing the second test like barely. But then having to lose the 55 pounds that I gained when I thought I would only gain maybe 25 or 30. And that was a super big struggle for me. And now my scale is put back in my closet. I very rarely, like if I look in the mirror and I feel like I'm having like too thin of a day, I'll weigh myself. And if it's under 115, I'm like, okay, come on. You got got to work out. You got to eat a little more. Because I want to keep the number above 112 always yeah. whereas before I was like I need to stay in the one O's and the day I stepped on the scale and I was 101 I was like yes I'm getting there I'm almost to 99 and it was just it was scary yeah it's so scary how we put so much like power in a number yeah or put so much power in like our like the size of our body yeah without like focusing on you know like I think in like relation to like Kim and Courtney, right? Because we were talking about them earlier, you know, Kim losing a lot of weight to fit into Marilyn's dress or seeing Courtney's journey on the Kardashians this season where she's kind of like owning her curves and she's like, yeah. you know what? My husband tells me that I'm beautiful and I'm gorgeous regardless and I've learned to kind of just embrace my body as it is. And I think those are really hard things to do, right? Because yeah. oh, we're, we put so much pressure on ourselves and I think the outside world puts so much pressure on it. Mm-hmm. And I can only imagine like you being on camera and having people judge your body yeah. and then compare you to like, you know, Lala, or Brittany or Stassi who are also pregnant at the same time and how there's, you know, they're naturally those comparisons. And so you compare yourself. And so to get yourself into a healthy headspace to be like, I need to focus on what's good for me and not what, you know, my insecurities are going to bring to the surface or what other people are going to talk about online. You know, it's just about finding that peace within yourself. Totally. And I always feel like when, you know, you have a public platform, it is important to talk about those serious topics that sometimes are taboo. Sometimes, you know, people are too afraid to speak on because just opening up about eating disorders, miscarriage, infertility, like there's so many things that so many people go through. And like in life, you know, we all share all of these experiences. So to be able to have an outlet to speak about it and that other people can listen to and be like, oh my God, I'm not alone. Yeah. I just think it's huge. So no, it really is. I love like last season, I or not last season, last year, I went through a really heavy grieving process. Um, I'd lost my grandmother who was like my mom and I mm. like my anchor, my person, right? I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, and I, I lost her last year and it was so hard for me to go through and I still had to work, right? I'm single. I, you know, I can't go to my mom or my dad and be like, hey, can you pay my rent this month? Like I had to keep a roof yeah. above my own head. So I kept taping through all of that. That, but I started to open up about what I was going through with yeah. people and they were able to relate to that and I feel like by being open and by being honest you know I think there's a certain boundary of like not you know shoving things down people's throat like you know obviously deal with your own emotions the way you know you need to de- process them in a healthy way but just by being open with people yeah. they're able to relate and then we get through things together uh-huh. you know and I feel like that's so much more healing than like where I was at you know 22 going into a treatment center secretly and trying to deal with my eating disorder yeah. on my own that was really hard and that was really challenging and I you know felt so isolated and when I kind of peeled back that that curtain of shame and just was like open and honest yeah you know I found that there was a lot of support around me totally well hats off to you that's amazing Thank and you. just even you getting the help on your own 
that's huge. Like that's such a big step in the right direction. And now look at you. Here we are. Here we are. Yes. And shenanigans. Shenanigans. All right. Should we switch gears and yes. go back to Bravo? Yes. All right. I need to know your take on the Kathy Hilton drama. Do you believe Kathy? Ooh. Do you believe Rinna? What do you think? Break it down for me. And then we'll get into Erica Jane and everyone else. Okay. Um, I mean, the Kathy Hilton stuff is wild. So yeah. I, one of the segments that I have on, well, I guess it's not the podcast, but it's like an extension of the podcast that we do on YouTube is book club. And so it started off as Bravo book club and we would read different Bravo star books. And then now it's kind of gone to more like just different celebrity reality star books. But one of the books that we read recently was called House of Hilton. And it dives into like the Hilton dynasty and it gets Ooh. into the three sisters, Kyle, Kim and Kathy. And and their mom, Big Kathy. And the stories about Big Kathy, Sheena, are insane. No way. So, like, Big Kathy, she... One was, so I remember watching American Woman, which is the series Kyle produced right. about her mother. And so that kind of made it seem like their mom was abandoned by their father who cheated on her and like left her as the single mom to provide for them. And, you know, and we've obviously hear, heard really endearing things that these women have said about their mother. But when you read the book, you realize like she was no saint herself. And I always like to take things with a grain of salt. Totally. Right. You know, but the stories in there, like there's one story about how she met Kyle. Kyle and Kim's dad and he was married at the time but she found her goal was always to kind of like go after really affluent and wealthy men because that's how she was going to get taken care of and she kind of instilled oh. these values into her daughters marry rich men have a lot of babies with them and then you'll always be taken care of and while on the side also make sure you're pursuing a career in Hollywood and obviously we know Kim Richards was a big star when she right. was a child and then now Kyle Richards is kind of a big star in pop culture today and Kathy Hilton married Rick Hilton but like one of the craziest stories was she tracked she tracked down the wife of their dad so he was married at the time so she ended up meeting her at a bar spiked her drink followed <gasps> her out to her car what? and then slammed her ankle in the car door and no. then told the police that she got attacked by this woman first Wow. Yeah. I mean, again, with a grain of salt, this is all alleged, but these is by, you know, this reporter that, you know, really investigated a lot of their upbringing. And so the stories in the book are uh, tellings from people that, you know, grew up with them. You know, I think that story was told by, you know, their stepsister who that was her mom who got the, her ankle smashed oh, in the door. Wow. But like, so there are lots of like crazy stories like that. Or there's another story about how she hired a man to teach Kathy, little Kathy, Kathy Hilton, when she was younger, to teach her how to have sex better. She hired <gasps> a guy to teach her, you know, certain things so that what? she could go out and find herself an older, wealthy man that, you know, found her, you know, good enough to to put a ring on it. And so my thing is, it's like based off of how these women were, were raised, because it also talks about how she raised them to kind of compete with each other, even though they were three sisters, they were she would pit them against each other to fight for her attention because it made them more ambitious. And so the more ambitious wow. she would make them at home, the more ambitious it would make them in their own careers. So when we see the issues with the women on the show now, I'm like reading the book and getting the context that we have. Uh -huh. I understand how they have this competitive nature. Right. And I understand how, you know, there may be tones of jealousy amongst the three of them and I can see how Kyle may be a bit of a whipping post to like Kim who we've seen really erratic behavior yeah. and we see some of the outbursts that Kim Richards has had on the show in previous seasons and we can see how, and I can see how you know some of those outbursts are, are outbursts are really reminiscent of Big Kathy and their mom the outbursts that we've heard about her or read about in the book and you know even with Kathy Hilton I think when we watch this season of Beverly Hills and we hear some of the things that she's been, you know, accused of saying or doing, I think I kind of believe Lisa Rinna a little bit. And I know Lisa Rinna's a potster and she definitely speaks with hyperbole and yeah. exaggerates things a lot. So I think, again, take it with a grain of salt. Right. But I really believe that there is a possibility. I think the biggest thing is we don't see Kathy deny anything this season. Right. We don't see her say, I never said anything like that. I never did anything no, like that. No, in the that. last episode, you kind of see her owning it. Or and you kind of wanting 
trying to brush it, it under the rug. Be yeah. like, I did Stay it. Silent. I said it. Uh-huh. You know, let's let's just kind of move on. I'm sorry. I apologize to all the women. She called all of the women off camera. Right. I mean, you're on a reality show. Yeah. When you're calling everyone off camera Dude, and apologizing. You're not like that. No. And you call <laughs> all of the women to apologize. And, you know, it, it, you to know me, that looked like it was damage control. Yep. You wanted to make nice with all of them. Yeah. Um, because now you realize that this is being talked about. And I think, you know, she wanted to kind of conceal some of the things that she did and said. I've heard some of the alleged things that she did and said. And I also want to clarify because I know in the finale, there's a clip from No Filter that gets played and it kind of makes it look like Erica or Erica and Lisa are leaking things to the press. And that's kind of the narrative that we build in the finale. So who did Uh, leak that to you? (laughs) So I can say it was not a housewife. It was not a cast member. Was it a friend of? It was somebody that's close to the production of the show. You know, I think... And I think with Beverly Hills, too, it's like people always want to blame the women for leaking things to the show. But right. like you know how many people are at these tapings, you know, whether it's hairstylists, makeup artists, production people, producers. And sometimes when you're trying to drive certain narratives or storylines, you know, you want you you leak things to certain people. Well, you know, yeah, that happened with James and Raquel's engagement at the reunion. It was like a day, two days later, same yeah. date, whatever it was already came out and we're like I mean there were a hundred people on set yeah how are you gonna pinpoint who leaked it yeah and we're also in this culture of like a Dumois I mean look at how Randall yeah, scandal got exposed Dumas. you know I yeah. fucking hate Dumois Dumois is like a hemorrhoid in my asshole I hate Dumois because they they just they always I say low budget tea they always put yeah. out like low budget tea or rumors and a lot totally. of it's unverified yeah. they just kind of put stuff out there without anon. realizing it's like, anon yeah. yeah anon please and I'm like listen I know anon is, is bullshit but so there are many ways to get information there are people that were in Aspen that I got pictures and video clips from when they were out at restaurants and stuff and so you know there are multiple ways that someone like me can get information Uh that's not necessarily from cast members that I try to be very careful of like getting too close with certain cast members to make sure that isn't what happens and listen I've had housewives that try to come to me that try to be like oh so here's this and they try to craft this like narrative and I'm just like (laughs) thanks for the information but I'm going to stick to what I you know you know my narrative of what I see and how I view things so I'm not easily influenced so I don't like that that you know that narrative of you know totally of getting those leaks yeah they try they have tried Sheena but I can say Erica and 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 Rinna none of the women on the cast member none of the women on the cast were any of the leaks that I got about the stuff that was going down in Aspen well that's good what do you? So what are you, is your that. take on uh, the Erica Jane legal drama and seven hundred and fifty thousand earrings? Ugh. Or are they one point five? Or what did she say? She said yes. So, and I was like, so they're seven hundred fifty each. Yes. So no, no, no. So it was seven fifty total. But this was from these earrings were purchased like twelve years ago. Okay. So th- oh, now they've gone up. Yes. In value. Now they've gone up in value. Gotcha. Well, the one point three is, I guess, the estimate that they have now. But I don't know if there's been a proper appraisal that's okay. been done on the earrings yet. Um, I mean, obviously, we saw the earrings in Aspen. It wasn't my favorite to see her wearing the earrings. Obviously, she had the messy moment of being like, I don't care about anybody else but me. And so, you know, with me, I always like to play devil's advocate. And I always like to look at both sides of the coin. And I've studied the legalities of, of the Girardi case in depth. I've had many lawyers, legal analysts, people from the California State Bar all come on the podcast and like try to break things down. I feel like I've been like legally blonde. Um, so <laughs> I love that. I feel, and I've read court documents and Google terms like I've done yeah. all of it I feel like you know people think that you know sometimes when I will say things that I'm just like an Erica Jane stand I'm like but no I've actually like you know read court documents and talked to lawyers and journalists about this kind of stuff but so I don't love a lot of Erica's behavior on the show but I always like to yeah. say there's a difference between likability and culpability so I can defend the culpability because based off of what we've seen I don't think she's guilty of actually doing anything there have yeah. been no criminal charges I think you know I mean you know it's the tale as old as time young blonde marries older rich man totally. he doesn't tell you anything no. as long as the car doesn't get declined at ne- neiman marcus like you know you don't really care yeah i you mean don't i don't even think questions. she knew how to like use an atm or there was no. something she said like i've never had to do that in my life it no, was like all the bills went to girardi keys all of yeah. her amex bills were t- being taken care of by her husband so i don't think she knew where the money was coming from yeah um but 
I understand where a lot of these women are like, I would like you to have more compassion or empathy for the victims. Yes. But I also understand her point because I always like to play devil's advocate. This is why I get dragged on, on Twitter. She <laughs> um, I also understand how when you're in the middle of a legal case and there are a lot of people making accusations uh-huh. and those accusations haven't been proven in court or by a judge, you know, and these people are like, these earrings belong to us or not even, I don't even think it was the clients that were making that accusation. It was the... Um, the trustee that was making that accusation right. because they found out that the earrings were purchased not from Girardi Keith's money but from money that belonged to an actual client and they linked the transfer and Tom pulled the money out of that client's trust account and used it to buy these earrings oh, but you also God. have to remember Tom Girardi isn't the only person at this firm there right. are a ton of other employees there's a bookkeeper there are people that are signing off and authorizing these things Yeah. so I'm like Erica Jane had no idea what was going on at the law firm. All these other men and employees that work there, I think we should hold them more accountable and we should bring them into question. And I have. And um, but with Erica, you know, the earrings, I think is it's really hard to watch her say, I don't care about anybody else but me. And then the next day she wears the earrings on the I show. Know. She's since given up the earrings. Um, her lawyers filed for an appeal, but they I think that's since been settled and the earrings have been liquid or in the process of being liquidated and the money will go into the bankruptcy trustee. It's not guaranteed to go to any of the victims. It's guaranteed yeah. to go to the creditors. And right now the creditors are bank lenders and people that are claiming that they loan Tom money and are entitled to that money. So I understand gotcha. where she is also a little reluctant to give up the money or to give up the earrings too, because it's like, if I give up these earrings and I, you know, and people think that it's for the victims, is it actually going to the victims? And right. the reality is the order of precedent within the trustee is that it's going to legal lenders. It's going to the banks that, you know, have a lien against Tom's house or whatever the case may be. It's not necessarily guaranteed to go to these victims. And as of right now, we only have two of them that that actually have a secured um, debt with Girardi Keys, where a judge has oh. looked at it and the judge has said, yes, you were wronged as a client of Girardi Keys. Wow. So it's a lot more complicated than I think people realize. Totally. But I would like to see Erica just kind of let her guard down, which I feel like we started to see yeah. in the, her therapy session with, um, yeah, you know, on this last Dr. Episode. Jen, yeah. you know, and we see her have, you know, somewhat of an endearing moment with Sutton where Sutton's like, why can't you just have a little more compassion in your voice? And she's like, well, at the beginning, all of last season, She's like, I was trying to be open and honest with you guys, and you didn't believe me. You thought that I was lying. Yeah. And so now my guard is kind of up. So do I love all of her behavior? No, but I do understand that she's kind of in this fight or flight sort yeah, of mode. completely. And it's an impossible situation. I think a lot of us would like to say, I would do this if we were in that situation. Yeah, but you don't know until you're in the situation. No. And you don't know what kind of calls she's getting every day and yeah. everything that she is having to deal with that she never yeah. asked for. She didn't, like sign up for this yes right. she married a man but like not to be put in this position right and nobody ever thinks that they will be put in this no. position i don't even think tom thought he would be put in this position because i think he thought he, he had thought too much get power with it. but you know that's why i loved in like the scene with garcelle and sheree this season where sheree garcelle's like i would give up the earrings and sheree's like that would be a really hard thing to right? do garcelle she's like you have to understand like that's an, i wouldn't so easily just be like here are the earrings and i think yeah. a lot of us would like to think like i would want to i would want to know where's yeah. the money going and i would also want to believe that if i were in that position i would be like here are the earrings but that's obviously a, a lot harder to do when you're in that situation. Yeah. And when you found out that the last 20 years of your life, your marriage was an entire lie. And this man was yeah. conning not just all these people, but you as well. Yeah. So crazy. So crazy. Nuts. Is she going to be at BravoCon? I haven't even looked up the lineup. Yeah, she's going to be at BravoCon. Oh, Lisa Rinna will not be at BravoCon, but I don't think she was ever supposed to be at BravoCon. I think when the original announcement came out. Uh, Lisa was not part of it and people were like oh my god she I mean, got fired. I mean I wasn't part of the original Yeah that's what I mean. Like, yeah. Either. So, I don't think Ariana was. Lala wasn't. No. They just. And it's you guys, so weird how they do things where it's yeah. like they'll announce a few people. I'm like are you just saving the best for last because I was the Clearly. last Vanderpump announced. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. But yeah no Erica is going to be there. I believe all the women except for Diana and Lisa Rinna are going to be there. For so I do season. wonder why. Like for me I'm like what is the benefit? I feel like with Lisa Rinna like she's so hated by everybody right now that like what is the benefit of showing up at bravo con and having to face a lot of these people when nobody really likes you you know oh that's a valid point i don't know i mean i hmm. i think listen in my 
ideal world, I think Lisa Renna should maybe go on pause and take a little bit of a break just for her mental psyche. Yeah. You know, I think she's a great villain on the show and she's obviously a lightning rod she's that great. gets everybody yeah. talking <laughs> and I love watching her as a villain. But just from like a human side of things, I'm like, you just lost your mom. You're going through this yeah. grieving process. I can't imagine being 100%. the villain and getting all of the heat that she gets and, you know, having to continue, continue to show up for work and, and do that. I just think maybe she needs a little bit of a break just for her own mental health. Yeah, definitely. We'll see what happens. I we'll hear the see. reunion is feisty. Oh, can't wait to see that. Well, I will be at BravoCon, so can't wait to see you guys there. Um, I know. I wanted to host the Vanderpump panel at BravoCon. Oh, that would have been not, awesome. I know. I was like, Who is it? Is it Lene? I think. I think so. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't make it to BravoCon after all this year. But I was like, Bravo, if you want me to moderate a panel. That, oh, that would have been I awesome. Yeah. You were, though, just at another conference recently, the oh, biohacking yeah. one with Brock. Yes. Okay, so tell me about that. He came home. He was on <laughs> such a high. He had the best time. Thank you so much for inviting <clears throat> him. I had COVID, so I couldn't go. <laughs> We had such a blast. We he, we were like guinea pigs, right? What I love about Brock, though, is he was so easy. Like, when once we had the mic and the camera and we were, like, going to different, like, activations at the conference and interviewing people, he's, like, such a natural. That like, He was just kind of, like, doing his own thing. And he was, I was like, oh, you're making my job easy today. You yeah. Can, you can run the show. But so we went there to kind of look at the latest and greatest in, like, fitness and wellness trends. Yeah. And so we did, like, this, like, um, brain tap thing where we, like, wore these glasses and had this music. Music and this man like talking into different ears to like rewire your brain. Yeah. Which is funny because we just saw on the Kardashians, Kendall making Chloe go to get her brain scanned. Oh, right. And do all that stuff. And I was like talking about it on, on the Spotify podcast. I was like, yeah. And so I have one of the things and, and it remaps your brain and people don't realize like your brain can be so fucked up, but you can like fix it um, or like do things to help enhance, you know, certain parts yeah. of your brain. And so we tested out all of these different like trends. He had me doing all sorts of fitness stuff. Like I was like embarrassing myself on camera, <laughs> like trying to compete with him to prove like who's stronger oh, that's in certain instances. But no, it was really fun. And biohacking is really just like this conference that like um, helps you hack your genes, so to speak. It's more about like less about your regular genetics and more about epigenetics. And epigenetics okay. are where you change certain lifestyle, make certain diff different lifestyle choices, be it with food or fitness. And so a lot of like their fitness trends are like how to, you know, get a 60 minute workout in like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, how to get a meditation that you, you know, get your head in the space of a one hour meditation, but do it in like 10 minutes. And so it's all about oh. applying these things that, you know, help your body adapt or or change or enhance uh -huh. in a shorter amount of time and so it's kind of like a cheat sheet for your mental health your physical gotcha. health um and we like i said we had a blast he took me in the sauna he did a cold plunge in his speedo oh, he loves to cold plunge oh my God. he did the cold plunge <laughs> in his speedo and he's like are you getting in and i'm like i don't have a speedo and i don't have those muscles i'm not getting in this <laughs> um but thank you for the offer uh but no we we had a lot of fun he we even got to like interview dave asprey I was like the founder of biohacking and we learned like about his like mineral coffee. We learned so much fun stuff. Nice. I wonder if there was anything with EMS there because that's what I did to start getting back in shape after baby because that is like a 60 minute workout in like 15 minutes or yeah. whatever and zaps your body back into shape. But I did also get electrocuted my last session. You got electrocuted? Yeah, I never did it again. I got full on convulsion electrocuted oh with a kettlebell in hand like a 10 15 pound Wait, is kettlebell. that what we saw on the show uh no oh, oh yeah yeah the same with, type of workout yeah yeah but it was a little different this one didn't have the wires hooked up to the machine it was just i don't know if it was bluetooth or whatever the fuck it was but all of a sudden it like jolted and i was like ah and then the guy was like, are you OK? I was like, yeah, that was weird. It just like kind of shocked me for a second. Keep doing the workouts. Thankfully, it was nothing with the weight like over my head. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it shocks me again. I have the kettlebell. I drop it. I'm in full convulsions. Like I go down to the ground. I land on my like wrist right oh here. My gosh. I had a massive rug burn, but it was a wood floor and bruise. I could not believe I didn't break anything. Oh my God. So I personally don't recommend that anymore, but it, it did help after the baby. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, so if there's anything else like that. I know M Sculpt is great. Yeah. But there's M -Sculpt. there's so many tips and tricks to 
biohack. Yeah, we were doing like a that vibration machine. Where yeah. You, we were, he was making me work out on that. So it was fun. We taped a bunch of stuff and we recorded some interviews that'll come out on the podcast nice. over the next couple of weeks. But we we had a blast. I love it. It was so much fun. Well, to wrap up this podcast, I wanted to talk about, I know you have a background in celebrity nonprofit fundraising, and you were formerly the executive director of Jenny McCarthy's foundation, which was inspired by your brother, Ethan, who you mentioned earlier has autism. Yeah. So just tell me a little bit more about that and how other people can help with this charity. Yeah. I mean, I started, well, my brother was diagnosed when I was like 10 or 11. Um, so I started doing a lot of like fundraising stuff in high school. And, you know, luckily, I think when I was around 16 is when I got to meet Jenny and I would fell in love with the foundation. I fell in love with the work that she was doing. And so I started like volunteering and interning in the office. And it like over the course of nine, almost 10 years went from, you know, office volunteer in turn to executive director and I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I got to have with her actually just had her on the podcast and we got to like catch up on so many things but you know I think it was such an important time in my life doing that type of work and I think you know if anything I just for us it was empowering to know that there are options that are out there you know the foundation was um would provide medical grants to families that had children with autism that would help with giving them access to like autism specialists and we would cover their doctor's bills we would do lab testing and help them with nutritional counseling and give them vitamins and supplements because i don't think people realize what like when it comes to like biohacking like how much those types of lifestyle changes can really help so like with my brother we removed gluten we removed dairy we started implementing vitamins and supplements we had the carpet in his room pulled out we painted over with non-toxic paint we got him a non-toxic bed and we didn't realize like how much those small changes can really make a big impact on him and you know were helped him think clear helped him focus in in school helped him you know be able to verbalize how he's feeling and be able to have a conversation now he's 20 so he's like a teenager and he thinks he's cooler than everybody and like doesn't (laughs) want to talk but at least it's selective you know he chooses not to want to engage in conversation but you know he has come so far and I just think there are so many resources that are available today that people can access and utilize and they don't realize how small lifestyle changes can make such a big impact on people's lives yeah and so you know I just think if there is anybody out there that has you know an individual with autism I think we often see like the good doctor where we have these really high functioning cases where right. we see, you know, like the, a lot of these individuals are, are really bright or really intelligent or maybe just have some social quirks. But I'm like, there are a lot of, you know, individuals that are more on the severe side of things. And those were the types of families that we really tried to help to address some of the medical issues that they were facing. And so, you know, there are options out there. You guys just have to be willing to, to kind of do a little research. I love Jenny's books, you know, Louder Than Words, I think was an incredible book. Mother Warriors. I wrote a book called A Shot of Hope that came out back in like 2014 I was like 21 at the time so it's been like a wow. minute since that came out and it ended up getting like bought by like Simon and Schuster which was like really cool and I loved the process yeah. Of, yeah it was so much fun um I would love to write another book at some point but you I know there ask are you that, yeah you I, I want to There's I want so to, to I want to figure about. out like what it's going to be but yeah. you know um, especially like merging like my love of like wellness and pop cul- wellness and health with like pop culture and like totally. how do you merge the two um, how do you be the housewives guy on Bumble while also loving to go to the biohacking conference with Brock Davies <laughs> and do a cold crunch <laughs> with Brock but well, we'll, we'll see but yeah um, but yeah, it was, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful. The interview with Jenny is out now. We kind of catch up and, and you know, talk about where where our lives are now. And I'm, you know, grateful. She buys the wine. I buy her lip glosses. And we love kind of that. like continue to support each other, which is which is great. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was fun to switch the mics and, yes. you know, tell everyone where they can find you and your podcast again. Yes. So I host a podcast called Hashtag New Filter with Zach Peter. It's available on all podcast platforms. We release new episodes Monday. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and do live streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays on our YouTube channel. And then I'm now hosting a new podcast with The Ringer and Spotify. It's for The Ringer's reality TV podcast. It's called You're Doing Amazing, Sweetie. And we release new episodes every Friday on Spotify. So you can catch recaps of The Kardashians latest news with the Kardashians, product reviews. Maybe I'll even at some point like do a full body skims that we'll film and put on put on there as well. Love just to that. make it fun. So <laughs> thank you, Sheena. Yes, thank you. And thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next week. Bye.